Hello everyone, a uh, very good evening and welcome to STEM Graduate Colloquium. Today we have Professor Thomas and Professor Rainer as our speakers. Professor Thomas completed his PhD in Poland, following which he worked as a postdoc with Austrian Academy of Sciences and Center of Quantum Technologies in Singapore before joining NTU in 2012. Professor Rainer obtained his doctorate in Germany he also received a prestigious fellowship from Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. After working in Max Planck Research Group for one year, he joined NTU in 2006. Both of them recently won an Nobel Prize in Biology. Today, they'll be discussing about some magnetoreception models and award-winning study on insects recognizing their magnetic abilities. So let's welcome Professor Thomas and Professor Rainer. Okay, great, thanks. So, um, I probably have to press here something, right? Maybe, maybe this here. Hold on. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. But oh, okay. Yes, hang on a second. I know. Yeah, yeah. I have to re redo it. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because it's green. So you can see it better. Um, okay, so this presentation, right, um, we will actually split in two parts. Uh, you will see later on. Uh, the first part is given by, by me, the other part by Thomas, um, sort of a tech team. Um, and we will talk about uh, in vivo biomagnetic characterization of the American cockroach, or quantum sensors and the American cockroach. Um, Besides uh, the two of us, um, the, let's say, experiments were done in a team, uh, mostly from a physicist. Uh, Li, Jung. Uh, Li Jun was uh, the PhD student on the um, experiment, and Herbert and Agnieszka were the uh, postdocs. We had also some uh, support from the biology side. Um, and also, um, we are still, let's say, um, doing some experiments uh, related um, um, to these studies um, right now. Um, I, I think um, Thomas will um, show one or two slides on this. And they are actually Kai Sheng, who is maybe in the audience. No? Yes, so yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, up there. Uh, exactly. Um, he, he has. Yes. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, he's continuing on some of the studies. Okay, so let's start. Um, so, the, the purpose of this talk, or the, the reason why we get the uh, opportunity to talk, to talk to all of you, is that we actually won the Ig Nobel Prize uh, for this work, right? Um, and the idea of the Ig Nobel Prize is that first, uh, this achievement should make people laugh, right? But then also think, so what's actually happening, right? Um, what, what is the physics behind it or the science? And we got actually the Ig Nobel Prize, the 29th one, uh, for discovering that dead magnetized cockroaches behave differently than living magnetized cockroaches. I, I, I actually have to add, um, similar things, or let's say also different behavior, is true for non-magnetized cockroaches. Okay? Um, so, the Ig Nobel Prize actually um, is already um, um, uh, running for almost 30 years, and there are a lot of um, uh, prizes uh, given out, let's say, to just give you sort of the mood, uh, uh, which prices for which type of research is going out here, let's say two studies uh, from previous years, 2015 and 2010. So one very notable prize is on the reception and detection of pseudo profound bullshit. Um, very important um, to actually, there's a study which actually looks at, let's see, how people, students, anybody uh, reads articles and uh, uh, perceives actually. Um, the things which are written in there, uh, although it's maybe scientifically proven or just uh, bullshit. Um, 
Another very interesting article, especially if maybe someone from the senior management is here. I'm, I'm not sure, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, it's actually, uh, 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 this is a so-called Peters principle. Um, and uh, this group has actually demonstrated mathematically that organizations, big organizations like NTU, uh, would become more efficient if they promote people at random, right? Um, so something maybe um, um, to take note as well. Um, okay, um, so this is one, it's actually maybe worthwhile to go to the web page and there are a lot of more um, hidden games um, um, you can actually look at. And again, uh, there's always, uh, there's actually really some truths behind this. So um, it's worthwhile to read through them. Okay, so the talk, how is it structured? First I give us a rough motivation why we are doing this. Um, then uh, I will talk about magnitude reception in general and our experimental realization. So our system which we actually used and how to detect this um, um, small magnetic fields. Um, the second part, which is uh, covered by uh, Thomas, we will talk about the measurements itself, uh, the theory behind it, um, um, what we can actually say about uh, um, the results or about the measurements, uh, how we can model this, and give some conclusions on this. Okay, so for the motivation. So you, you may sure know that, let's say, both of us are um, physicists, right? And in fact, we are quantum physicists. So I'm experimental a quantum physicist. Thomas is a, a theoretical quantum physicist, right? He is a theorist, I'm an experimentalist. Okay, so at some point in time, he actually um, came, or we actually met uh, uh, at a coffee. He said, well, yeah, you know, there are this, this animals which use uh, quantum mechanics to sense magnetic fields, right? And they use this also for uh, sending these magnetic fields for navigation. Right. Well, seriously, um, quantum mechanics, I mean, it's a little bit uh, stretched. Well, but on the other end, there were quite a few, um, um, there was a long discussion and a uh, few papers on this and it seemed to be um, possible in principle. So the, the question um, then was, okay, so in our, our lab, we have a very, well, we have built a very sensitive uh, atomic magnetometer, right, uh, which can detect very small magnetic fields. Can we actually use this to um, shed a little bit light on this, on this discussion? Right. Um, so in principle, it's, it's, it's a good idea to maybe load it with some biological samples. Uh, but which ones? Right. I mean, there are a lot of, if you look in biology, there are a lot of different animals, right? Um, well, anyways, we didn't know, right, um, which ones. Um, and then we, um, so, so uh, Thomas got, got actually hungry, and we went for, um, in, the, um, in the canteen, for getting something to eat and let's say looking for the animals. What we actually found is, well, here we go. <laughs> you, you can, you can uh, keep them. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, we, we use the American cockroach as you may see on your lamp. <laughs> um, so if, if you actually uh, assume that animals can, um, um, uh, let's say, use or let's say navigate, right, by using different sources, one, let's say, think maybe that the, the, they can use the sun, the position of the sun, uh, to navigate with an inner clock. Uh, or the polarization pattern, which is actually changing um, with, with the directions. Or in the, let's say, on, on the Earth, we also have the Earth magnetic field, right? And the intensity is changing with the location as well as the direction. And uh, the idea that animals can actually uh, use this uh, for uh, their purposes, for navigation, for example, it's called magnetoreception. This is uh, uh, what you're interested in studying. And in fact, um, this ability to uh, sense magnetic fields um, 
was actually seen in, let's say, different type of studies before. So in some behavioral experiments, which I will um, show later on, where um, um, animals were studies, how they behave in the presence or not presence of a magnetic field. Um, and also in some histological studies, um, where candidates uh, or, or mechanisms uh, for this uh, microreception were actually found, uh, or let's say traces of these mechanisms were found um, inside the um, body of the um, um, animal of study. Okay. Um, however, uh, no real, uh, let's say, tests of the mechanism at living organism were, were done as, as of now. Um, and in what type of animals um, this microreception was actually observed? Or um, 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 behavioral experiments indicated it. Um, so there's a quite a, a big list. So uh, we have uh, bacteria, insects, honeybees, fishes, and um, there were quite a few experiments on birds, uh, migration of birds in uh, magnetic fields, and uh, also there were experiments with uh, cockroaches. That's the reason uh, why we actually um, used uh, uh, the cockroach. So um, this behavior experiments, um, one of these um, experiments by Vlitschko um, et al. Um, was actually shown that um, um, one used, let's say, cage with this European robin and applied a magnetic field and then actually look at the direction this uh, European robin will actually take off. And uh, um, if one actually averages over all uh, these directions, there is a, um, 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 let's say, maximum in the or, yeah, uh, significance in the taking off in the direction of the uh, magnetic field which is applied, which is uh, done in, in various uh, uh, directions. So this actually indicates somehow that um, um, this bird can actually detect the direction of a magnetic field. Similarly, um, uh, something was actually shown for um, bacteria. They're actually um, um, bacteria which has uh, 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 synthesized uh, single uh, uh, domain particles, uh, in this case, uh, magnetite. Okay? And these magnetite particles are then aligning themselves on, in a chain and um, pointing uh, in the direction of the, uh, or, yeah, the direction of the Earth magnetic fields. And um, it's actually believed that uh, this bacteria is using uh, this um, uh, magnetite particles to, um, um, let's say, find the direction of up and down. Because the Earth magnetic field actually is pointing a little bit inside the, um, inside the Earth. Um, right, so also here we actually see that animals are using the Earth magnetic field for, in this case, uh, finding food. Other examples uh, um, also include, for example, ants, right? They are, um, this is maybe a little bit counterintuitive why ants uh, would need uh, to have a, a compass, but also here it was actually shown that um, ants uh, were actually, uh, um, or could actually go to a, let's say, a very symmetric, um, uh, in this case, a pot, which in one case there, there was uh, some food hidden, which I could not see, see beforehand. Um, and uh, the direction of where they actually have to go were marked with a magnetic field or with a magnetic field direction. Um, so after a while, this, this actually ends uh, new in which direction they're, they're going, which direction the food was, and then uh, the magnetic field was turned, and it was actually shown that um, the, let's say, um, um, uh, ends will go towards the direction of this uh, uh, magnetic field to find the food. Right? Although at the end of the day, there was no food for the ants. And uh, let's say the last example, last but not least, is the American cockroach. Right? Also here, uh, there were some experiments um, which actually have shown um, that American cockroaches put into some, some big petri dishes and the activity of this uh, insect we actually observe, depending on applying magnetic fields or not. 
and it actually turned out is that um, the um, um, let's say um, uh, cockroaches where actually this magnetic field were actually applied had a higher activity than the um, test um, um, sample. And there, from there, actually, um, it was believed that uh, the American cockroach can sense uh, magnetic fields. However, the question is how, right? Um, and that's actually not really clear. So there are a few um, uh, mechanisms which actually could explain how, um, um, yeah, biological systems could uh, measure magnetic fields. One are chemical reactions, regular pair mechanism. Um, actually, we have um, an expert here in the audience, uh, Michelle Bayer there. Uh, thanks for coming on this. Uh, where actually um, the, the basic idea is that there are certain chemical processes uh, will use, well, let's say, yeah, will proceed in different time scales depending on the magnetic field strengths. And this one can actually, um, if one designs this correctly, maybe use to measure the um, strength of a magnetic field. Um, another process is ferromagnetism, where, um, as we have seen, seen before, there are, let's say, small magnetic particles inside um, the insect. And then the alignment of those magnetic particles will actually show in which direction uh, the Earth's magnetic field or any other type of magnetic field would be. And the last uh, mechanism, which is uh, not so popular, but um, it is also there uh, is that uh, certain type of animals can actually measure electric fields, right? For instance, charts. Um, and if you have, let's say, a charged particle uh, inside, uh, moving inside uh, um, uh, a magnetic field, and if you can measure then the charge or the position of the charge um, due to the um, Lorentz effect, you can actually measure the magnetic field at the end of the day. Um, what we can actually do with our, um, let's say, with our experimental capability is actually to look at this process here. Right. Um, and uh, this uh, um, uh, ferromagnetic uh, particles are, uh, can be magnetite or some graphite particles. Right. Um, this uh, uh, particles were actually seen um, inside uh, certain insects, in this case, in, inside, inside ants. There were this, uh, let's say, small scale particles, which are typically in the range of a few tens uh, of nanometers to, let's say, a uh, few hundred nanometers. Um, and um, also the uh, uh, crystal structure actually identified these uh, particles as uh, uh, magnetite. Furthermore, um, uh, there were studies on, let's say in this case also again, ants, on the, uh, uh, let's say, magnetic properties of ants. And also here was actually seen that there is a, uh, a magnetization um, of, the, of the ants. And uh, this is actually changing depending in which area um, or which, which area of the, of the animal one is actually dissecting. Okay. So um, knowing actually that these particles are inside uh, insects or inside, inside animals, um, there are also biologists actually came out with a few models, how one can actually um, think of uh, to use them for uh, measuring magnetic fields. So for example, if these particles are inside some container, uh, flexible container, if a magnetic field is applied, um, this unpolarized uh, sample will polarize and then actually deform this container. And uh, from this measuring this deformation, one can say something about the um, magnetic field, magnetic field uh, direction and magnetic field strength. Or another um, uh, possible mechanism would be if um, these particles are somehow attached to a wall, for instance, a cell wall. Um, also, initially, they are not aligned. But if uh, uh, once aligns them, then they will attract and um, can actually then uh, again deform the cell wall, depending actually in which direction the magnetic field is applied. So um, if these particles are sort of exist, there are a few ideas how these animals can use them for magnetic field sensing. However, um, 
it was not proven or not shown actually that this is a, uh, a mechanism which actually takes really place inside the insects. Um, so what do we have? So we have um, uh, behavioral experiments, which actually indicates that animates uh, can sense magnetic fields. We have magnetization experiments, which actually show that inside uh, these insects there are particles which have uh, uh, magnetic properties. And we have some models which sort of can bring both together and uh, show that um, it, it's not totally um, unreasonable to um, think that um, this is a particles can cannot be used for uh, measuring uh, magnetic fields. However, um, there is no direct evidence of the dynamics of these magnetic particles in a living organism. Okay, and by actually analyzing the particle environment in the living organ uh, uh, organism, one can actually um, say something about if this particles are actually suitable for magnetic reception or not. And how we do this? Uh, by using a very sensitive uh, measurement system. And uh, now actually the physics starts. So what we're actually using is a uh, atomic all optical magnetometer. Um, the basic idea for actually how to measure their sensitive magnetic fields is um, we're using a cell, a gas cell, out of uh, cesium atoms. Uh, cesium atoms have actually one um, angular momentum, ma magnetic, uh, and with this one uh, magnetic momentum. It's an uh, alkali atom with uh, one valence electron. And um, this magnetic moment is processing, so if you apply magnetic field, it's processing in this, in this magnetic field. And uh, the precession speed, or the, the angular frequency of this precession, tells me something about how strong this magnetic field is. And the, let's say, direction of the uh, uh, precession or the spin of, uh, the, um, of the atom um, can be actually measured very precisely with the laser beam, with the interaction of a close resonant uh, laser beam. Okay? Um, this actually modifies, let's say, the optical properties, in this case, the polarization of the beam. Okay, and uh, the, the basic idea is, um, first, we use a, a, a cloud of, uh, or in cell, a gas of, of cesium atoms, and polarize them in the extreme MF states. Um, um, then, actually, we switch off um, uh, the laser beam, uh, wait for a certain amount of time, let them process inside uh, uh, this, that's a very weak magnetic field, and then, again, uh, switch on uh, a probe laser beam, to read out the uh, population at a certain quantization axis. So meaning actually if, um, um, let's say, the first alignment in a certain direction, the quantization axis is actually given by the, the, this alignment. If they are changing, the quantization axis is changing, and then actually this distribution of the M states are changing, which I can then measure again with my laser beam. Okay, uh, very precisely. Um, as you may um, can, can um, see, um, the, let's say, purity of this uh, polarization or initial uh, uh, polarization and the time for this, this possession is very important for the sensitivity. So meaning actually that if you have, uh, if you have a cell, we want to, uh, let's say, uh, have inside the cell um, a spin polarized gas for a very, very long time. And typically, um, this is a little bit tricky, uh, especially in a low, low pressure cell, because at a certain uh, 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 at a certain time it will interact with the cell wall, and then it can uh, stick on the cell wall due to physics option interaction with the cell wall, or um, uh, hit the cell wall and then actually flip the spin. Um, to actually circumvent this, we have uh, used a paraffin coated cell which actually um, um, prevents uh, the spin from actually uh, defacing or um, 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 uh, flipping, um, and actually gives us a, um, let's say, a very long um, um, coherence time for our atoms. So they actually can um, sustain, without losing the polarization, uh, 3,700 collisions with the cell wall. 
Okay? This gives us then at the end of the day a, uh, um, a line width of about 4.4 hertz for the uh, beam uh, for the probe beam. Okay. Um, this is the experimental setup. Um, so we start with a um, um, laser, uh, um, an external cavity diet laser, stabilized uh, with a saturation spectroscopy to a cesium cell. And then this goes to a fiber into our measurement set, uh, setup, this atomic uh, magnetometer. Um, this uh, measurement setup, especially the cesium cell, is actually shielded from any type of magnetic field, actually from the Earth magnetic field with a six layer um, magnetic shielding. So inside, we will have uh, only residual fields in the range of about uh, 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9 Gauss. This actually, we will also, again, try to um, uh, cancel with an additional um, cancellation, active cancellation coil set up inside this uh, magnetic field shielding. And then um, we, let's say, use this laser, let it interact with the cesium gas, and look at the precession of the spin of the cesium gas, which we then detect uh, uh, with a polarometer which detects uh, the change of the polarization of the laser beam. Uh, and this is actually a sort of a typical signal uh, which we are seeing. And from here, let's say by just measuring, let's say sitting on a, a certain point, by just see, uh, looking at the change, we can say something about the magnetic field. And the precision which we achieve uh, with this system is uh, we get a sensitivity of about 14 femtotesla per square root hertz which is decently low. And with this system, we're actually able to um, say something or to measure uh, this residual, very, very tiny residual magnetization of this American cockroach. And how this experiment is actually um, uh, performed, this actually you will hear from Thomas. Yes, thank you. As you see, no joke science, right? <laughs> so I'm a theorist, but I'll try to be a serious as Reiner. So, um, before I go to this, let me try to see. Before I go to explaining what have we done to cockroaches, I'd like to stress one more thing about this te quantum technology that Reiner just introduced. Namely, it's what is critical in this particular device that is built in Reiner's lab is that it operates at room temperature. That's super, super important. And I think you will understand it best on an example. So here's a device for magnetoencephalography. Magnetoencephalography is a technique of measuring magnetic fields of your brain. Typically, the typic typical device looks like this. Well, you know, you kind of sit here, and around you, there's this bulky equipment because it has to be so bulky because inside there, there are very sensitive magnetometers that require super cooling. Essentially, you put your head here, and a few centimeters around your head, it's 70 Kelvin, which is like minus 200 degrees Celsius. Not very comfortable situation, you must admit. You need all this equipment because this stuff does not operate at room temperature. And in order to measure the magnetic fields of our brain, you need this femtotesla sensitivity that Reiner, that, that Reiner already mentioned, the atomic magnetometers can also achieve. So here's really, you know, I think an interesting opportunity even for businesses, right? It's this, I stress again, the atomic magnetometers have the sensitivity of this bulky equipment and they operate at room temperature. So what you can do, so here's a, so here's a device that the setup, the Reiner's setup is like optical table, so it's still half of the room, let's say. But people have been neutralized some, some of this. They are not as sensitive, but this is exactly where the research right now is going to try to neutralize it and keep the precision. So this is something that is as big as a coin, right? And the cool thing is, so here's your laser. Here, it starts here. It goes through the cell. It goes to the detector. It's essentially the same principle, but it's small. And it operates at room temperature, which means that you can stick it to your head. 
it won't harm you, and importantly, it can come closer to, this, to, the, to the sensors of the previous device. So the magnetic field is also bigger, because it typically decays with the distance. So you gain also at the, in the magnitude of your signal. And here's, here's, a, here's a picture how this device you know, may, may look like in the future, I don't, and this is from already built right on some, some of these guys. Okay, so this is what we have. We have an atomic magnetometer that operates at room temperature and it's super sensitive. And this is how an American cockroach looks like, just in case you haven't seen it, which I guess here it's almost impossible, but maybe if someone just arrived. So uh, we've been asked a gazillion of times why American cockroaches, and I usually give the answer that for political reasons, but yes, relax, you know, this is, this is, this is an easy going talk, you can laugh, you, you, we're just chatting, if you, oh, by the way, if you have questions, just go ahead and ask them, I'll try to answer. Uh, so, but in fact, you know, this American cockroaches, in Latin, Periplaneta Americana, is just the most common cockroach around here. It's also very common in, in the southern US, so I guess that must be the reason for the name. What do we do? Sketch of the experiment. In essence, we magnetize, we put an American cockroach in a magnetic field, in a strong magnetic field with lines like this, perpendicular to the thorax. This is the thorax. And it turns out that we can magnetize them. So they actually produce magnetic field after this that is very similar to this dipole field that you see over here. So now I will tell you a few more details how we do that in practice. Uh, well, it's an, so it's a serious experiment. So we, you know, we're trying to repeat this stuff in exactly the same conditions. We're trying to control as many things as we can. In particular, cockroaches were fed magnetically characterized food. This was cat food, cat palates. It turns out it's actually magnetic. So you, you know, you have to keep track of that. So. One of the things that we did to um, be sure, not, not be sure, but at least to some degree justify that what we observe is not coming from the food, is that we have starved one of the cockroach for a week or so, giving it, on, it only water, and then we put it again into measurements and we saw exactly the same what we saw before. So, which means that it's probably really not from the, from the food. Ah, because in the 1930s, there was a paper in, in the, in this biological literature showing that the mean pathway of food for, for the cockroach from eating to poo is three days. And uh, something like this. And it, no, the, I think even the small portions of the food stay in the cockroach up to four days. And typically it's maybe a day or something. Something like this, about a day. So we characterize this food, we use well-characterized permanent magnets the cockroach container, you will see in a second how, how do we actually deal with them in practice. The cockroach container, it turns out, also can be magnetized. Actually, once you have this kind of crazily sensitive device, it's pretty hard to find something that is not, that is hard to magnetize. Essentially everything gets magnetized and you can detect it with this device. So, and turns out that this cockroach container also we managed to magnetize. So, and that will be clear in the data. So one thing, since probably all of you have seen the cockroaches, they run fast, <laughs> really fast. It's not so easy just you know, to deal with them when to catch them and, I don't know, and put them into the magnetometer, right? Or you can ask them kindly, dear cockroach, please, ki please kindly come to my magnetometer. It doesn't work like this, right? So here's the trick. It turns out they are cold, or they are insects, they are cold blooded. So what we do to actually deal with them consistently, let's say, or without, uh, yeah, without much trouble, is to first put them into the fridge. Because they are cold blooded, in, the, in this four degrees Celsius environment, they will slow down and even go to sleep if we, if we keep them there sufficiently long. We usually don't keep them that long. You can, they can move, but not so fast, right? I really recommend you trying this at home. It's impressive. It is, yes. You catch a cockroach, put it into the fridge, check if it eats your food. It won't, because it goes to sleep. So that's exactly what we do. We put the cockroach in the fridge, then it, for 10 minutes, let's say. Then it stops moving, after which we 
oh, oh, is this, because the people took a lot of photos of us after this whole event, right? Well, you can imagine, and I would like to stress that we did not handle the cockroaches like this, that, you know, I put the, put the hand to, a, to this, to put a hand to, to grab a cockroach. We actually tried that. It's really not easy, and it's easy to, to harm, the, harm the animal. So that's definitely not how you want to do it. Just put it gently into your fridge. That's it. Once it's cooled down, we packed it into, into this box container tightly. It doesn't move, it cannot move much, as tightly as we can. And we place it on permanent magnet where it feels three kilogauss field for 20 minutes. And this permanent magnet has like north, north uh, pole here and on below is the south pole. So the field is essentially orthogonal to the thorax. So this is how we magnetize them. After we have magnetized them, we put them inside this device that Reiner explained in detail. And um, yeah, so it takes, it takes a moment to load them. Essentially, what we have inside this device is a translation stage. So we put a cockroach on a translation stage and move it there and back, there and back, there and back, as long as our patience allows. We try to do it long. We, for example, even a few days or maybe a week and this, is, this brings me, by the way, to an, to an interesting comment about quantum technologies, which is that quantum technologies are not only precise, which is, so this is what is usually stressed, but they are accurate. Accurate means that they don't change over time. Atoms are the same today, they will be the same one week later, and they will be the same one month later. Imagine, so just to stress where, what's the advantage here. Imagine that you want to measure gravity and you take a mass and you put it on a spring. This will tell you more or less what's the gravity in that, in that position. But now imagine that you do it for a year. Well, at some point, your spring will start to mm, get longer. <laughs> will start to get extended and extended. And it's hard to control these things. There will be a drift in your data because it's not the same today and one year later. Atoms are the same today and one year later. Accuracy of quantum measurements is probably one of the biggest advantages there is to quantum technologies. We can measure these magnetic fields for a week easily. Kind of, I guess Reiner will disagree with the statement, but let's say easily. So what really happens is that the cockroach is not here, it's right above the cesium cell, and it goes there and back, there and back, there and back for a week. So that's essentially how the signal looks like when the cockroach goes there and back. And clearly there is a difference between, between what we detect if the cockroach is far away from the cell and when it's close to the cell. And, that's, and you can work it, we can work out from this what exactly is the magnetic field produced by the animal. So we essentially managed to magnetize each and every cockroach. They do contain magnetic materials, number one, you know, outcome of this experiment. You can magnetize a cockroach, but in order to detect this, you need a very sensitive device. And we measured 15 cockroaches for longer than 10 hours each and had a bunch of shorter measurements, which essentially all confirmed what I'm going to show now. So the typical data set looks like this, where each dot or each square is obtained after 20 of this average over 20 of such motions there and back, there and back, there and back. And we measured, so here there, this, is, uh, this is drawn for 10 hours. That's a typical, typical data set. We have, some of them are slightly different, but you know, more or less this is what we see at, at all times, right? And when you do this average over 15, so when we, let me say what's what, right? So this is the data, this is the dots, the black dots are, are the measurement results, the magnetic field decay from a living cockroach. And the average of those guys is about an hour, whereas the black, this blue squares is the data for the dead cockroach. And there you see that it takes much, much longer to demagnetize it two days on average, right? So this is, this is, so this is exactly, essentially, actually this is the data that won us the prize. Here's the difference between dead and alive cockroach in their behavior, right? Think about this moment over here, right? The dead cockroach is still magnetized. The alive cockroach is no longer magnetized. And by the way, this, this dashed line over here, this is the signal from the container 
everything gets magnetized if you have this kind of sensitive device. Everything is above this one, right? And this container signal is stable within 10 hours. So yeah, so what, right? And the first thing that probably comes to mind that is a, a hypothetical implication from this kind of data is explained, no, in this video, they do to have it. I have to. Sh hmm. Where's your screen here? No. Yes. So it doesn't. So we have, we prepared a video that shows hypothetical, maybe application of this. Namely, that cockroach is more magnetic, so it would stick to a fridge. <laughs> whereas a live cockroach is less magnetic. So it won't stick to a fridge. And you can try it as many times as you wish, and it doesn't stick to a fridge. So now I have to now I have to emphasize, <laughs> now I have to emphasize, very good, that this was hypothetical. There's a disclaimer here, and let me read it. Any resemblance to actual cockroaches, dead or alive, is purely coincidental. This video is a dramatization of actual experimental findings. The residual magnetization of the biological test sample is not sufficient to hold the sample against gravity on ferritic stainless steel surfaces. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to read it on one brief and <laughs> next time. Huh? So I stress again, you actually, although it's really a pity that when, when we were doing this experiment, it didn't occur to us to put cockroaches you know, on the fridge. Somehow it didn't. So this is a joke. And, but we have made calculations based on our data which show that it should be impossible to stick the cockroach to the fridge. So really, this, uh, this is really impossible. That's not an implication. So you cannot write a paper with this kind of outcomes. You have to have something more serious, and so we're I'm moving to more serious things. That's the data again. And let's now try to analyze what do we learn from this regarding what Reiner said, the possible magnetoreception or ma sensing of magnetic field of cockroaches. And th the simplest model that at least came to our mind is the following. Well, we managed to magnetize each and every cockroach. So inside there, there are some magnetic materials. And maybe what, really, what happens is that when we put the cockroach in very strong magnetic field, all these magnetic materials align with the field. That's exactly. So maybe for those of you who are not physicists, that's exactly what a magnetic needle likes to do in the magnetic field. Think about a compass. A compass is something that when you move it like this, the magnetic needle will follow the magnetic field of the Earth. It likes to align with magnetic fields. So that's exactly what would happen inside the cockroach. These magnetic needles like to align with the field that we applied there. But then, when we take it out, when we take it from the permanent magnet and we put it inside the, the, the magnetometer, which is so well shielded from any external magnetic field, so there is no, no longer any aligning magnetic field, and all of these magnetic materials sit at room temperature, which means that little atoms around them jiggle and heat these magnetic materials, and because when they heat them, they cause a little rotation. This is called the Brownian motion. Typically, it's described for, for a motion. So when, when, a, when, when a magnetic material or whatever, when, a, when some material moves randomly. But exactly the same phenomenon happens for rotational motion, where now they would rotate randomly. So what happens is that magnetic moment number one will rotate, let's say, to the right. The second one maybe will rotate a bit more and, or less. And you, know, you get some random, random rotations. And when one works out what exactly would be the decay time predicted, or the shape, maybe first of all, shape, shape of the magnetization curve that you observe from this kind of theory, it turns out it's exponential. You can fit it to our data very nicely. And there's a specific time to this exponential decay given by essentially the product of the volume of these magnetic materials and the viscosity of, the, of their environment. So we were actually wondering, OK, what? So, this looks like a reasonable model, right? The simplest that comes to your mind. If you think, can think about something even simpler, let us know. That's, mm, we'll be super happy to learn. If you know about something more complicated, don't let us know. 
We want to keep things as simple as possible. And especially in the, in the context that this is sometimes, this magnetic reception sometimes appears, you know, in the context of quantum mechanical studies and quantum mechanical effects, we actually took care not to have any quantum mechanical effects. This is all just the motion of little magnets. And we don't ask where do the magnets come from. You need quantum mechanics from that, for that. But once there, this is just a classical motion of little magnets. So actually to shed some light, we measured also uh, this hysteresis of a cockroach. So this is measured on a dead cockroach. You know, we magnetized the cockroach in uh, different magnetic fields and looked what's the magnetization of the animal. And from this you can conclude that the magnetic materials inside are not magnetite, perhaps grygite, because of some properties of this particular curve. So I move on. How does this model actually explain the data? The decay time, yeah? Question? No. The decay time depends on the product of the volume of this magnetic material and viscosity. When animal dies, there is no good reason to think that magnetic materials changed dramatically. So volume is the same, the viscosity changes. So that's, so post-mortem change in viscosity of the environment explains this dramatic change from one hour to two days that we observe between a life and dead cockroach. And that makes sense because when the animal dies, it dehydrates permanently and that causes the bigger viscosity. Actually, people also observed viscosity increment in, in biological studies on, sing, on single cells. They were, when, and that's what, exactly what happens, that their viscosity increases. But there is a little interesting detail in this data that it turns out that the initial magnetization of the dead cockroach initial means here at, at zero time, is different from the one, from the alive one. And we see that consistently. It's essentially in almost every data set. You can, you can have plenty of, a few models of that, and we discussed all of them in the paper, but I'd like to show you one that I think is the most interesting from theoretical perspective. Rainer mentioned that I'm a theoretical physicist, so I tell you one thing about this. Namely, they, this smaller mag, initial magnetization from a, from a dead animal may come from the fact that actually, if the animal is dead, not all of the magnetic moments align, just some of them align. And that leads to a smaller initial magnetic field. And when you take this seriously and you consider magnetic moment in external magnetic field surrounded by an environment at temperature T and viscosity eta, you can work it out how long does it take for such a thing to align with external field. And interestingly, in the, in the limit when this viscosity is high, the answer only depends on viscosity. So you can work out from here what's the viscosity without any free parameters. I don't, you know, it's just interesting from theoretical perspective that you don't have free parameters, it just follows from the data, what's the viscosity. And so on and so forth. Once, once, we, once we take all the experimental parameters and we fit it to these models with Brownian, with Brownian, Brownian rotations, it turns out that we, that, Consistent uh, data sets is that we have particles of, of radius 10 to 100 nanometers, more or less, you know, what consistent with this data from histolo hist histological studies, and they rotate in very viscous environment, like super dense honey or something like this. Well, if that is really true, so here's the most interesting conclusion from all this. If that is really true, that would mean that we re this using of, of this permanent magnet with three kilogauss strong field is essential because it would take hours for the magnetic moments to align in Earth's magnetic field. And because of that, this is probably not how this, this is an indirect evidence that if cockroaches really can sense magnetic fields, they do it in a different way. It's not based on rotations of little magnetic needles because it would take hours, completely useless. <laughs> And actually, there have been some, some bio, behavioral experiments on cockroaches where they react in the, in the time scale of minutes. So also incompatible with that data. What would this other model be? Oh, I'm already late. Uh, but yeah, that is because this is probably what some of you would be interested in. I will not tell you what this other model is. I would like you, but nevertheless, I'll show you some data and if possible, for those of you who do not sleep yet, try to think about this on your own. So here's the data from birds. 
Something similar can be measured on cockroaches, but it's much better documented on birds. It turns out that birds have inclination, not polarity compass. What, what that means is that the bird, you know, actually, if you take a magnetic needle, you take normal compass, it has, there is a north to it and there is south to it, and, and, magnetic, and the, the north of the needle will point towards the magnetic north of the, of the Earth. Birds don't sense that. The, it doesn't matter. If you, people have done these experiments where the direction of magnetic field was completely reversed and birds react in exactly the same way. They are not sensitive to the actual arrow of magnetic field vector, but only to the direction of this magnetic field. Somehow. So second strange result. This magnetic compass is, is disturbed in weak radio frequency fields. Third, it actually adapts to the intensity of the static field. So they took birds and they placed them in an artificial static Earth-like magnetic field, but 10 times bigger. And at first, these birds didn't know what to do, but after two or three hours, somehow they knew what to do. Very interesting. This adaptation might be really something physical as well. And finally, the, my favorite, which is really mind-boggling, that all this compass depends on the frequency of light. So it turns out that if you place birds, if you put birds in red light, they don't know where to fly. The compass is disturbed. If you put them in white light, they know where to fly, and so on. Somehow there is a critical frequency above which they know what to do. And for a physicist, it's kind of clear more or less what's going on. It's like photoelectric effect. It's precisely the same. It starts at certain frequency. It shows you that something most likely gets excited in this system. You have to overcome some energy for the whole machinery to start. But I won't tell you what's the model. This is, this is the hardcore data. Think about it yourself. Yes, take a photo of this slide. You're very welcome. And what do I have next? Aha. Actually, should we think that, okay, this is for the birds, and I, now I will give you an argument why I think it's actually plausible that very same or very similar mechanism might be working in cockroaches, many, plenty of other animals. Namely, think about early history of the Earth. So now time travel. The Earth is four times, is four and a half billion years old. Oh, a propos, uh, <laughs> a propos billions. Uh, I was going to, I brought here, I was asked by someone to bring here one of the, pri one of the prizes of this Ig Nobel, or one of the things that we are given in the, uh, as the Ig Nobel award is uh, this 10 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. These guys really went for 10 trillion. I always wondered how, you know, how, how, the, how you call a number which, is 12, which has 12 zeros, now I know. So if you, so please have a look and maybe pass it all, but bring it back. <laughs> So, billion is 10 to the 9. So, Earth is 4.5 billion years old. This Zimbabwean dollar is trillion. Okay, anyway, and it turns out that actually, more or less, 1, million, 1 billion years after that, very early in the history, magnetic field occurred. It was so early that this is some artist at NASA that pictured how the Earth was looking like 3.5 billion years ago. What can you see here? Well, there's water, that's, that's actually pretty cool. There's water and there's not much more than that. Just some rocks and smoke. There was no life except extremely primitive forms of life. Therefore, essentially all the evolution happened in magnetic field. From this perspective, it is actually very natural to expect that animals will, would sense magnetic field. They would somehow manage to recognize this particular stimulus. And perhaps this is the reason why so many different animals were observed to react to magnetic fields. Uh, that's, I like that one because it brings you back in time and then back here. So perhaps this is also my, why, not a bad reason why cockroaches and birds could have, could have similar mechanisms of sensing. What else?